Okay, hello everyone, and welcome on behalf of Histori Horse Historical Materialism to the panel discussion on the book Socialist Feminism, A New Approach by Frida Afari. We are very excited to get started and to talk about the pressing matters and ideas conveyed in this book. We are thrilled to be joined by several inspirational feminist scholars. For example, Rosemary Hennessy, who is the L.H. Favreau Professor of Humanities and Professor of English, as well as a faculty affiliate with the Center for the Study of Women, Gender, and Sexuality, which she directed from 2006 to 2015 at Rice University. Next, we have Oksana Dutchak, and she is a co-editor of Ukrainian Commons Journal and fellow at Berliner Institute for Empirical Integration and Migration Research. Oksana is devoted to engaged and public research, which contributes to public discussion and policies, trying to give voice to workers and other structurally underprivileged groups. Next, we have Wanda Powell, Professor Emerita in History and Ethnic Studies at Los Angeles Southwest College. Her long academic career of over 40 years includes teaching in the Los Angeles Community College District, tenure as Department Chair of Behavioral and Social Science, Passage Program at UC Irvine, California State University Los Angeles, and numerous other conferences and community engagements. Yulia Yurchenko is a senior lecturer and research in political economy at the University of Greenwich. Her research focuses on state, society, capital complexes, and transnational class formation, and on the political economy of post-Soviet countries. She is also a member of the Ukrainian Solidarity Campaign UK and the Democratic Socialist Organization in Ukraine. And finally, Frida Afari is an Iranian, um, Iranian American librarian, translator, and author of Socialist Feminism, A New Approach. She brings the insights gained through her study of feminist philosophy, her international activism, and her work in community education as a public librarian in Los Angeles. She is also the producer of the websites Iranian Progressives in Translation and Socialist Feminism. And I will be the chair today. My name is Cassandra Rivera. I'm a graduate of California State University Los Angeles and the University of Alcala. I'm a socialist feminist activist as well as an educator. So the structure of today's panel will go as follows. First, Frida will be reading an extract from her book to introduce the book. Then our panelists will offer their comments and questions on the book to which, to which Frida will then respond, okay? And finally, we will end with a question and answer section from the audience, as well as me, the chair. So please feel free to enter your questions in the chat and I will relay them to our panelists. Okay, so without further ado, hello and welcome Frida and congratulations on the launch of your no, new book, Socialist Feminism. Thank you so much, Cassandra. And I would like to thank all the panelists today. It is such a pleasure and honor to be part of this panel and to have such a stellar and committed group of feminist scholars and activists um, commenting on my book. So I am thrilled. So I will uh, start by reading uh, a few pages from the conclusion to the book, which can give you a very good sense of the book as a whole. And then I have a couple more comments to make before we hear what others have to say about the book. So here's the conclusion, which is entitled, Socialist Feminist Revolutionary Organizing in the 21st Century. In this work, I started by arguing that the global feminist movement has entered a new stage with the rise of the Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter uprising, 
as well as global uprisings against authoritarianism, imperialist invasion, war, and ecological protests for saving the planet. All of these movements offer tremendous questions, opportunities, and challenges for socialist feminist organizers. At the same time, the terrifying reality of growing fascistic grabs for power and imperialist war revealed the immensity of the challenges we face. Vladimir Putin's genocidal invasion of Ukraine, the white supremacist January 6, 2021 coup attempt, and the legalization of vigilante assaults on abortion rights in the United States as well as the return to power of the misogynist and racist Taliban in Afghanistan after a withdrawal deal with the US imperialist occupier. They all portend what might be the future for all humans in the 21st century. A global imperialist war seems imminent. In this context, this book, this book's effort to rethink socialist feminism for the 21st century can help address these challenges by getting to the heart of the problem that faces us. Transcending capitalism, racism, sexism, heterosexism, both at the structural and the personal level, transforming human relations and developing thoughtful relationships among humans between mind and body and between humanity and nature. Each socialist feminist conceptual framework taken up in this book has been a pathway to asking questions about how to develop a humanist alternative to capitalism, racism, sexism, and heterosexism. Theories of social reproduction by tracing gender oppression to the devaluation of women's reproductive labor, raise critically important questions about women's reproductive work in the family and in society at large, and how we can rethink and reorganize it. However, I argue that valuing reproductive labor or socializing or collectivizing it is not enough to overcome gender oppression. Authoritarian capitalism in the 21st century can do away with the family as the place for reproducing labor power, only to turn society into one large labor camp. It might even be able to use ectogenesis to turn the process of reproduction into an industrial one with terrifying consequences. Thus, theories of social reproduction give us only part of the picture of gender oppression under capitalism. Marx's critique of alienated labor and its relation to gender oppression, both as articulated by Marx and by various socialist feminists who have tried to theorize the relationship between alienated labor and alienated human relations under capitalism, pinpoint the extreme alienation of mind from body. I argue that this theorization is more adequate for explaining gender oppression under capitalism and can also speak to the new questions posed by the Me Too movement, which has challenged sexual harassment and gender violence in all spheres and especially among cultured and educated men. At the same time, the ideas and efforts of black feminist intersectional thinkers who challenge the erasure of black women and oppose both external oppressors and oppressive attitudes within the movement are critically important for developing a humanist alternative to capitalism. For Black feminists, the unity of theory and practice is not a slogan, but a reality, as seen in the creative ways in which intersectional thinking, 
has expressed itself in abolitionism and in Black Lives Matter. Queer theory and its challenge to fix concepts of gender and identity if in the context of advocating a reappropriation of humanist concepts of universality, subjectivity, solidarity, and ethical responsibility can also greatly expand the emancipatory vision of socialist feminism. I have argued that in contrast to Judith Butler's ahistorical approach <clears throat> to gender and identity, The efforts of various socialist feminists to draw on Marx's concept of a historical and ever transforming human nature are more adequate. Rosemary Hennessy's effort to connect alienated labor to capitalism's limiting of our human sexual affective potential. And Sheena Howard's refusal to accept the recreation of oppressive gender roles within, the, within LGBTQ relationships were singled out as urgently needed for the project of developing an alternative to capitalism. Eco-feminist thinkers, Maria Mies and Ariel Saleh, as well as other autonomous feminists, such as Silvia Federici and Kathy Weeks, pose important demands such as reclaiming the commons, creating cooperatives and establishing a universal basic income. However, they still do not address the question of how to overcome alienated labor. Audre Lorde's posing of the question of labor and life in her essay, The Uses of the Erotic, however, can offer us a glimpse of a non-alienated existence. In that spirit, I have returned to Marx's concept of an alternative to capitalism and his view of ending the domination of abstract time over the process of production in what he calls the, the first phase of a complete break with capitalism. I have also examined Raya Dunayaskaya's analyses of state capitalism in the former USSR and Maoist China because they can also help us develop an alternative that does not reestablish state capitalism. The questions of reconceptualizing the self-other relationship and of overcoming models based on domination are also integral parts of developing an alternative to capitalism, sexism, and racism. After exploring the existentialist and Nietzschean model of Simone de Beauvoir and the Freudian and alternative relational models of Jessica Benjamin, which are more familiar to students of feminism in the 21st century, I have argued that it is the dialectical and humanist frameworks developed by Alison Weir, Raya Donayevskaya, Franz Fanon and Audre Lorde, which can help us conceptualize relationships that overcome domination. Developing a coherent socialist feminist emancipatory vision for the 21st century, however, is both a theoretical, analytical, and a practical and organizational question. It demands grappling with what is new in the 21st century and reaching out internationally to global women's struggles against capitalist imperialism, racism, sexism, and heterosexism. And at this point in the conclusion, I share some thoughts about what this book's re-examination and rethink of, rethinking of socialist feminism can mean for international organizing now. So I will not read the rest and hopefully you will read the rest um, on your own. Um, and I would just like to add that um, uh, writing this book was a real uh, pleasure for me, but it was also extremely uh, 
uh, exhausting and it was really the work of a lifetime. And uh, there's no way that I could have written it. I mean, I wrote the actual text in, in a matter of um, two and a half years, but, um, but the body of it is really the product of 40 years of study and activism. And there's no way that I could have done that in a matter of a few years. And just the experiences that I've gained over the years that helped so many ideas mature inside me. Um, so um, it was a real pleasure. And I hope that this book can give a really fruitful ground to um, people young and old, all generations uh, who want to really uh, start on a, on a more, um, um, I would say more solid foundation for socialist feminism and, uh, and a real international foundation. So um, I would uh, also like to let you know that um, there is a workbook that uh, free, of, free of charge that you can access that um, gives you uh, keywords for each uh, chapter plus study questions and ideas for activities. So I'm going to just show you how to access that, uh, that workbook. One moment. Okay, so here is the Pluto Press page uh, for the workbook. And uh, then you can click on download the workbook and you'll see that it has keywords, discussion questions, ideas for activities. And so we have that for each chapter, including the conclusion. And I, I really think this can help <clears throat> both um, uh, educators, instructors, at, whether at college or community college or you know, study group level, doesn't have to be in an academic context. And it can also help individual readers. Um, I also have a PowerPoint presentation for each chapter. So if, if there are people who are interested in having me give talks on individual chapters of the book, I can certainly do that and the PowerPoints are ready to go. And then um, I also wanted to introduce the, um, the, uh, 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 the website, Socialist Feminism, A New Approach. Uh, let me share screen here. <clears throat> okay. So here's the website with uh, information about the book and endorsements and then uh, articles um, um, that have written about a variety of, of topics, the latest of which is confronting the US Supreme Court's assault on abortion rights. Um, there's an audiovisual section that includes um, interviews and dialogues with other socialist feminists, including um, <clears throat> uh, three of the ones that are on this panel today, uh, upcoming events, campaigns, um, Brittany Greiner, Afghan women, Ukrainian women, and then um, and just the contact page. So, you're welcome to um, go to the website and contact me if you have any questions. And uh, I will stop at this point and look forward to hearing others. Okay, thank you very much, Frida, for sharing part of your conclusion with us and for also sharing your work on your website and the workbook. Thank you very much. So now I'd like to welcome Rosemary Hennessy and invite her to respond to the book and um, ask any questions that she'd like to Frida. Microphone. Okay, first of all, thank you, Cassandra, for that introduction. <clears throat> and Frida, I want to thank you for inviting me to be part of this event and for addressing my work in, in it. Um, it's an honor and a privilege. 
in her book, Frida Fari makes a case for amplifying, <clears throat> for amplifying socialist feminisms, philosophical, political, and Marxian foundations in order to offer what she calls a humanist, socialist, feminist alternative. I want to begin with some comments on the book's interventions and contributions, and then say a few things about the section on social reproduction. <clears throat> the scope of socialist feminism, a new approach, is for me one of its most significant features and itself both a theoretical and a timely intervention. Afari's new approach makes a case for socialist feminism as an urgent response the 21st century crises, and she just pointed to a few of them in her comments. The book is structured around historical developments and authoritarian capitalism is certainly one, as well as key concepts, among them social reproduction, alienation, intersectionality, and queer, as well as political and theoretical practices that share affinities with socialist feminism, notably the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter, queer theory. And she goes on to make a strong case for Marxist humanism as an underexamined archive of socialist feminist history. I actually don't know of any other book that does this much work. Attention to socialism in public discourse, even among the most involved in left social movements, often lacks informed knowledge of its history and feminist contributions to it. When this history does surface, it's often fragmented into single issue lines of thought and action. A Ferry's book interrupts this fragmentation and understands it as one of the consequences of capitalism. Although anchored somewhat in the United States, the book also offers an expansive account of feminist scholarship and activism. The bibliographies for each chapter alone are an impressive and invaluable resource. I've already turned to them several times. In addition, the book has a 21st century timeliness. Afari's argument attends to the implications of the COVID-19 pandemic the relentless and lethal devaluation of black lives and recent developments in reproductive technology. In each case, it does so with an eye to critical resistance and the possibilities of a better future. I want to say a few words about the biographical details Frida offers in the book's beginning. The way I read it, this turn to autobiography it's not a sideline. It's a provocation to understand life writing as part of the socialist feminist project. Her narrative of the contradiction she lived as a young woman in Iran and then in the United States is instructive because it discloses the formation of a feminist standpoint and from ground zero of global capitalism by a woman from the global south introduced to Marxist humanism who converted that experience into an understanding of the lived realities of exploitation and domination. We learn, in other words, about the formation of a socialist feminist standpoint. There are too many of the book's other contributions for me to do more than just list them here. The return to alienation and needs by way of Marxist humanism is surely one. The case for pursuing that path through the work of Raya Dunia Scava and Audre Lorde is another. And just that pairing of those two intellectuals is an exceptional one. Afari reads Audre Lorde's concept of the erotic as being in tune with the Marxist attention to human potential and needs, potential and needs that capitalist relations foreclose. In this respect, 
she situates Lord as contributing philosophically to socialist feminism and from a diagnostic and aspirational standpoint. Donetskaya has been much overlooked by feminists in this regard as well. And I might add that Alexandra Kolontai has as well. Among the book's other contributions is its dialectical and global approach to reading that underlies the book's structure. The extensive empirical data on every topic, the instructions for movement building that Afari takes from the Arab Spring and Occupy movements. And last but not least is this amazing workbook. What a wonderful pedagogic resource. I'm already planning to use the book in my courses and I'll definitely make use of this really helpful pedagogic resource, which is the workbook. Chapter three on social reproduction is for me one of the strongest. It speaks to a longstanding contribution of socialist feminism, the recognition that the basis of women's oppression under capitalism is the devaluation of our reproductive labor. Afari offers a genealogy of that contribution, beginning interestingly with Margaret Benston. <clears throat> She sorts out distinctions regarding whether feminists have understood domestic labor as contribu contributing directly or indirectly to the accumulation of surplus value or not contributing at all. She skillfully walks the reader through some of the foundational concepts of social reproduction and their bearing on the key Marxian terms, value, surplus value, and alienated labor. Her explanations are exquisitely clear as she, <clears throat> as she elegantly parses out the different inflections and why it matters that we understand domestic labor as directly or indirectly contributing to the accumulation of surplus value. Her attention to some of the developments in reproductive technology and their implications regarding the relation between the family and capital are especially noteworthy. So I have some questions and I will bring in two of them here. The challenge of global warming calls upon us to address how capitalist relations have led to the earth's growing inability to reproduce the conditions that support life. The signs are everywhere. California is burning up. And that's just one example. While nature appears occasionally in the book, I am left wondering whether socialist feminism can be restricted to social life. Doesn't attention to reproduction have to take into account the destruction of nature, which as, Mar as Marx tells us, humans are a part of. Susan Ferguson, who Frida cites in the book, gives us a vocabulary to make a conceptual shift, I think, when she attends to capitalism's devaluation of life making. I find that term life making supersedes the severing of the human from the natural world, an alienation that is one of the casualties of capitalism. Attention to life making also can amplify how we understand the process and the scope of capital accumulation, appropriation, and hostility to life, as well as human reliance on the reproductive, uh, reproduction of nature. Teresa Brennan addressed this dialectic in her book, Globalization and Its Terrors, where she used the concept of deregulation to capture the effects of the extraction of value and its prerequisite alienation. The growing number of Marxist theorists are attending to ecology and the current planetary crisis and have put forward other terms like metabolic relations, but they often don't connect to social reproduction and domestic labor. Jason W. Moore's work may be one exception. 
to sum up my question here, do we need more ample terms for the requirements of the reproduction of life? Terms that don't reiterate the social nature split. Can the humanist Marxist theoretical frame despite or even with its focus on the human, be a useful analytic, even a bridge to a less partial understanding? Can it open the concept of value, not only to the question of unmet needs, but also to a conception of reproduction that spans human and non-human life and the possibility of resisting the alienating, deregulating, tendencies of capitalism. So that's one question. My second question goes to the concept of ideology. I'm surprised that the book gives little att attention to the ideological in discussing, in discussing reproduction. That is what happens outside and across home and market. I think of Althusser's ideological state apparatus essay, it's just one example, uh, published in 1971, um, in terms of this concept of ideology. Althusser was fundamentally concerned with the question of capitalist reproduction and pointed to the family, as well as the school, church, media, as institutions through which dominant ways of knowing are reproduced. The essay also points to the formation of social subjects as part of that task of reproduction. It seems to me there's more for us to think about as we develop clarity on what constitutes life making or social reproduction in conjunction with the human, with the, with the natural world. This ideological reproduction takes place not only through unpaid and underpaid domestic labor, but also through the institutions and cultural discourses that reproduce socialized, racialized and gendered subjects who are valued or devalued subjects and whose devaluation becomes in turn valuable to capital. The discourses that legitimize patriarchal domination and white supremacy are also of course questioned and resisted. I think consideration of the formation of social subjects as a component of social reproduction can enable a better understanding of the intersectionality of race and gender, of white supremacy and patriarchy as institutionally reproduced cultural discourses. They are weapons of domination that condition and enable the capitalist class relation of exploitation and thus indirectly contribute to the accumulation of profit. Frida, I welcome your thinking on ideology as a feature of life-making under capitalism. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Rosemary Hennessy. Thank you so much for speaking on the scope the timeliness among other characteristics of social feminism, as well as bringing up questions about uh, ideological reproduction. Um, Frida, would you also now like to respond to the two questions that Rosemary um, gave you? Actually, if you don't mind, I would prefer to hear all the panelists and then respond at the very end. Okay, okay, no Thanks. problem. Yeah, all right. Perfect. Okay. And so now I would like to welcome Oksana Duchuk to uh, speak on her thoughts about socialist feminism. Welcome, Oksana. Thank you, Cassandra. Thank you, Frida. And uh, I'm really happy to be here as I think that um, uh, I'm happy that I met Frida several months ago, though the circumstances were not really pleasant. But I also appreciate this um, to know this person because I think that it's uh, an exemplar of 
person who implement her philosophical um, beliefs in practical political struggle and standpoint, which I really appreciate. I also wanted to thank Rosemary for very extensive uh, theoretical comment, which allows, for example, for me to concentrate on a bit more different issues, which I actually planned. Now, so first of all, I think that I uh, also agree with that fact that uh, um, this book is a very timely contribution to the debates about the future of feminists and socialist feminists and the global political struggle in general. And as Frida notes and points many times in her book, we are living in a time of a numerous social movements and uprising uh, around the world which are protesting against dispossession, inequality, gender and racial oppression, imperialism and authoritarian shift of the global system. Uh, however, uh, what Frida also stresses several times and what we observe in living reality, solidarity and political um, organizational link and networks are not automatically built between these different moments. Um, so obviously far more should be done uh, for this beyond sloganeering and I separately thank you for this term. I'm not an English speaking person and I think it's a very nicely, very uh, sharp term to, to understand sometimes uh, the political reality and mistakes we are also making in our political activities. So what is needed to build these links and between different organizations and to build solidarity is, of course, everyday uh, political and organizational work. But what is also needed for this is a, uh, this what makes this common work and relations possible is understanding of the common roots of oppression and exploitation, as well as the common vision of the future, which is very often lacking. And I really appreciate the fact that you managed to put it into the book, at least in the form of open questions and alternatives, which are proposed by different uh, political philosophers, thinkers and activists. Uh, and I think that's also why your book is an important contribution to this uh, moving forward with political activism and building uh, links between different political struggles. Uh, what I found fascinating in Frida's book is a combination of this extensive and critical overview of current struggles against oppression uh, with um, a question of women experience and LGBTIQ experience and uh, women of color experience in the center. And it is combined in the book with a theoretical elaboration on the issues uh, of the multiple, how uh, these multiple struggles are rooted in a common cause, a com common system of causes. Um, and uh, so there is this overview of a big arsenal of social feminist theories, and it provides with the idea for, for reader and it is not too complicated what I also really appreciate so it's not this very uh, hard theoretical language which uh, distract and push away many many readers so it's really on the level which is um, easily comprehended by people who have a, a, even like a relatively basic knowledge about the matter. Uh, so what is stressed in the book is an explanatory power of this uh, different theoretical and philosophical elaboration for the political struggle. Uh, I really also appreciate the close reading of the original Marxist texts so like Marx and Engels, mostly Marx also, of course, uh, and uh, also of the later, later and current social feminist developments of the theory. Uh, it allows to create those lenses, the term you use and you borrow from uh, Liz Vogel, um, Liz Vogel, I'm sorry, my pronunciation, uh, theoretical perspective, which allows us to look on the reality and political struggle and which, which have um, a uniting potential for those struggle. So what I wanted to uh, speak a bit more about is the question of 
like a practical, maybe more practical political question, whether uh, social feminist uh, theories and philosophy, whether they have a potential to build the uniting frame for multiple political struggles, from climate justice to essential workers struggles, uh, from Me Too and Black, Black Lives Matter movements, from Syria to Ukraine and all the other which are named and many which are of course not named because there are too many of them in the book. Um, what I think and what Frida points to in the book very correctly and very um, explicitly, that it is this uniting potential, it's impossible without two things. First is uh, elaborated philosophical content behind the political struggle and the feminist solidarity if you're speaking about the feminist movement. Um, the answers to the, these questions, they can be found whether there is this uniting potential and explanatory power, they be, can be found, for example, also in Frida's book. And um, uh, for example, uh, some of this answer can be, uh, I'm not, I mean, there are many of them because there are many questions, of course, to the, about the future of feminist movement, but some of the answers can be found in Frida's book, which are, for example, that liberalism and its multiple political wings like liberal feminism or liberal environmentalism, they cannot provide us with, a sustainable, with sustainable solutions to structural problem that critique of neoliberalism and income inequality and i really appreciate this clear-cut statement on the matter that this critique is also problematic and can be viewed as best as a tactical solution which for example i also used and my comrades are also using but we should be very critical about that that progressive political struggle uh, must uh, reclaim and rethink the concept of humanism, which is much more than individual uh, liberal perspective on what humanism is, but which has this concept, a very powerful concept of Marxist concept of alienation behind. Um, and that is not all about economic exploitation um, and the issue of oppression should be also put in the center of the political struggle. Uh, Father, um, uh, I wanted probably to end with a, a quotation which Frida did not uh, manage to go that far in the conclusion, but I really think that it pretty much sums up the challenges of the political struggles we are facing and also the vision how uh, they should be done. Um, uh, so it's basically from the last page of the conclusion. Uh, that Frida has drawn on the contributions of thinkers whose vision of working out uh, the relationship between self and other, identity and difference, universality and particularity, and individuality, speak to a type of organization that is not dogmatic, but on uh, one that also offer an informative philosophical content, deeply rooted in history, and can deal with conflicts in a democratic manner, one that leads to growth for all parties involved. I think that that's the practical puzzle which is also needed extremely, together with a deep philosophical elaboration. And this kind of organization should practice feminist solidarity, which should be materialist, but should appreciate, which should pay attention to hierarchies of power, which should uh, give voice to those who are oppressed and listen to those voices, and which should care. And I think that is also very, for me personally, a very important feminist concept of care, which should be care also in a political sense about what we are doing, uh, whom we are giving and whom, what we, how we are expressing our solidarity. Through these philosophical concepts, which we can use and we should use, and which are so uh, fascinatingly overviewed in Frida's book and re co uh, connected with the very practical and uh, particular per concrete political struggles, together with them should go these uh, issues of organizational work and feminist solidarity. And in this way, uh, we should wage the struggle against oppression, exploitation, and capitalist alienation, but also against political alienation. Sorry. And that is probably the way to build the bridge between universalism and 
particularity which Frida stressed in her conclusion very sharply. Uh, thank you. I will stop here and thank you again, Frida, for it was a, a really exciting and theoretically extensive and at the same time comprehensible reading, which I really appreciate. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, I was muted earlier after Rosemary Hennessy and I, I, I realized you didn't hear. I was just saying that I would like to hear all the panelists before I respond, but thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, Oksana, for your praise on the book's practicality, as well as your own reflections intertwined with uh, words from socialist feminism, a new approach. That was just great. Thanks so much. Okay, and now I would like to welcome Wanda Powell. Thanks for being here. We're excited to hear about your thoughts on the book. I loved it. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, and I think the workbook is exceptional. Uh, it will be useful around the world with different organizations and women, no matter where they are, will be able to take something from it. I suggested earlier that oftentimes uh, they will have to go to small groups because as she quotes Audre Lorde, uh, dialogue is critical and in understanding that racism is the child of slavery, that historically we can go back to the beginning of slavery, alienation and the interrelationship, okay, between workers and those who would exploit the binary issues that were there, but now they're changing. And what is often forgotten unless you've actually spent some time on the historiography of Marx and Marxism, is the emphasis on interconnectedness and that it is necessary to analyze and review what is the reality. And this tool of historical materialism is a means by which we can look at the reality of the present, of the 21st century, what we're doing. And that's what Frida does exceptionally. She takes an understanding of what is a qualitative revolutionary change with its impact, but she never forgets the quantitative differences that are occurring at the same time, which is very Marxian. The important thing that I, I'll say it this way, because there's a quote from Octavia Butler that uh, kind of like talks about this interconnectedness. And it's a, a, a very simple phrase from her parable of the sowers. And it says, all that you touch you change, which all of our panelists know and all activists in the world know. All that you touch, you change. All that you change changes you. You, you, it changes you. The only lasting truth is change. Now that's important in order to understand what Frida Afari does in bringing Marxism and the humanness of the change of reconceptionalize, disregarding those determinants which would like to put him on a shelf because it's old, not taking into account the ability to use foundational ideas because he's a philosopher, he's a social scientist, Helgelian, okay? Um, in that sense, we begin to understand the need for women to actually participate in the change. That's what Frida is reaching out in this perception of dialogue. What is also exceptional because people often when they're talking about philosophers, they forget all women in the first place. The second part of it is the leadership of a group 
that has always been there and would be attracted to Marxism because they're looking for the means and the foundation to change. And that brings, brings back black consciousness. So whether it's male or female, but specifically male, well, when, you, when you listen to Brian Stevenson and he says, the opposite of poverty is not wealth. The opposite of poverty is justice. So as we seek to utilize all of the areas that basically Frida brings back into context analytically for the present, looking at both quantitative and qualitative changes, we begin to intersperse and understand that interconnectedness was understood by Harriet Tubman, was understood by Sojourner Truth. This being sons of, yes, we celebrate Audre Lorde, we celebrate uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones, 1619 Project. We understand all of them, and but formidable, formidable of this period of the 20th and leading into the 21st century are the foundations of bell hooks, the foundations of uh, Audre Lorde. And we'll start with this one from the Combahee River Collective Statement, which uh, Frida goes into in great detail. If Black women were free, it would mean that everyone else would have to be free, since our freedom would necessitate the destruction of all systems of oppression. This was stated in 1977. And we have to understand that this is a response to the feminist or first wave of, well, actually the second wave of feminism that occurs because most black women of that time would not even call themselves feminists. Alice Walker created the term womanist. And she created that term because feminists neglected to uh, actually deal with the contribution of women activists who were on the front lines in every milieu, every part of philosophical, academic, educational work, okay? In every, they were on the front lines of black power movement of the 60s. So her bringing this to our attention and bringing it to in-depth uh, reflection on these particular writers is more and more important. Now, uh, I'm just do a couple of issues in her text on Black feminism and interconnectivity. Uh, there is a quote from Audre Lorde, which I love, okay? Uh, it says very understanding that those in professions and academic often ignore the women who are in, in this COVID situation on the front lines, the nurses, the, we're, we're ignoring the transportation workers. We're ignoring that. And sometimes in that uh, section, you oftentimes saying, where are my people? Meaning where are the women? They're there, but they're fighting on a survival day-to-day -day kind of basis. And, but to reach out and be able to create dialogue, this is what she's trying to emphasize that Tarana Burke and others have been on that front line, Patrice Calores, they've been on that front line and they're reaching, okay, out. And that most of these movements Black Lives Matter, the Me Too movement are not accidental, inadvertent. These are fundamental necessities for the continuation of Black people and humans, period. That is the key. But she was saying very, very clearly in terms of that, it is learning how to stand alone, unpopular and sometimes reviled. Just let that resonate for a minute, sometimes reviled. And there is not a intelligent woman. There is not a woman on the front lines that has not experienced this. 
that has not experienced the horror of sometimes feeling totally alone, but it's necessary in order to create a solidarity movement and to create the discussions that we have that are also necessary, okay? We need to address and overcome the internal contradictions of the movement and not merely focus on opposing outside power structure. So the criticism of, let's say, critical race theory, that's examining the institutional ways that racism is perpetuated in our society and it's attacked, it's reviled, it is used in a way. And yet the problems that are occurring in the mortality death of infants of black women dying in childbirth, that is being ignored. And so it's important that we stand and understand some of those issues and that uh, critical dialogue continue in ways that we uh, often forget. Now, there are two things that she brings I, that I, I really want to point to. She brings out the idea that Gerona Burke talks about that in the Me Too movement, so many of the people who commit crimes and violence against women have actually experienced that violence as a child. So in order to deal with the domination issue, in order to deal with the healing process, you have to look at a structure where you will offer healing, not only to the perpetrators, but to the victims of their acts. That is important. She brings this out in terms of Tarana Burke that makes us reconceptualize and revisit what we mean truly by solidarity because personally in each of us are these contradictions that occur that are not addressed and therefore we fall prey, which is the second issue, is the socialization of domination that continues from the very beginning. I think it actually starts in the womb, that there are, they are people that are now telling you, you are detached from your body. Your womb is just a vessel. It has nothing to do with you as a woman. That they would be willing to destroy your life, human life itself, in order to perpetuate this dehumanized capitalism that is going on. And all activists who fall prey to what Afari calls the myth of American exceptionalism, and here she's uh, talking uh, with uh, uh, Kianji uh, Taylor, the important thing that is important to understand is that oftentimes both men and women are being taught, being told, being accepting of this hierarchy of what would be depravity of nothing else but depravity. And that it's important that there not be ideological color blindness. Some of these issues have been spoken by the speakers of, uh, before, but I think it's important that we go more. She says, there are lessons that Marxists can learn from, okay, to reformulate their approach to the relationships between exploitations and oppression. And in her workbook, she makes you, ask, and she asks that question. and. I think I would ask her to go into a little more detail on that. What is the, uh, the understanding today between exploitation and oppression? I will end with uh, uh, just uh, one other question that I had that is very, I think, uh, succinct um, that she takes, but I would like her to give a more specific example. 
we have so many women who have joined in the oppression of themselves that they are not critically thinking. They are desocialized to this oppression. How do we create solidarity and dialogue? Yes, I'm listening to the president of Ukraine last night and he succinctly says, food or you, meaning Putin, with to, if it means that I have to have you, then I will do without food. Water, I mean, it was so succinct, but it's words that I could hear from Harriet Tubman. I could hear so closely to many of the activists, Black and others, who have brought us to this stage. But I thank uh, Frida Afari for taking the understanding of this crisis formulated around COVID, but it's just an extension of a morbid, continuous oppression of people of color and people that are poor and people who want freedom and justice. Thank you so much, Frida, for uh, writing this book. Thank you very much, Wanda. Um, that was very insightful. Thank you for sharing the words from um, the Combahee River Collective Statement, as well as talking about women on the front lines and social domination, which Frida talks about in her book. I'm sure we found it all very you know, insightful and, and moving. Thank you. So now um, I would like to move to, um, Let's see. Ah, Yulia Yorchenko. Welcome. Thank you for coming. And uh, we're all very excited to hear your comments on the book as well. Uh, thank you for having me. It is an absolute pleasure uh, to have read the book. It is, it is a very long anticipated by me and not only text, uh, even before we knew that Frida was writing it, because this is the text that brings so many important things together. And, and it is an, an immense order uh, in an immense honor to speak alongside uh, such excellent uh, authors, uh, activists and panelists. Um, and uh, it's also quite beneficial to speak after uh, everyone else because you can you can build on that indeed. Um, I'm quite glad that Wanda has uh, uh, finished on the note of uh, uh, talking about imperialism because I'm a scholar of imperialism and I'm an anti-imperialist. Uh, activist uh, among being a feminist. And uh, one of the very many important things that are discussed in the book is that uh, there, there are principles and values that run through it, uh, that um, anti-imperialism uh, and the right to self-defense are principles and values of feminist movement. And if you're an anti-imperialist, you need to be against all imperialism, not just some. Uh, and uh, just like uh, in earlier comments, uh, Rosemary Hennessy has uh, highlighted as well, I also thought that the appeals to the personal story um, in, the, uh, uh, in the book were not accidental and were not merely an introduction to the story of the book. Because as a Ukrainian, as a feminist, as a school of class relations uh, and imperialism, I see so many mistakes that are similar to those that were made in analysis of the events around the Iranian revolution that are discussed in the book, uh, that are done in the analysis of Ukraine right now uh, and of Russian invasion. The same ilk of mistakes that are made by so many of those that are commenting on what is happening in Ukraine as a result of that invasion. And indeed, uh, so many historical materialists uh, do not learn from material nor from history, um, uh, and uh, do not learn from imperialism, and do not learn, do not take their personal stories and the contradictions that shape them to inform their analysis, which this book combines in such an excellent way. It is extremely refreshing then to see this analysis that is so poignantly aware 
of, of certain traps uh, in writing such complex and uh, all embracing books. Uh, and uh, you so eloquently avoid falling into those traps. It's, it's, it's a beautiful text. I want to speak also, I want to mention, I want to appeal to this issue of ideology that was mentioned earlier as well, as something that underpins subject making and institution making and effectively life making uh, in feminist praxis and scholarship. I see that in Ukraine, for example, um, uh, as uh, in the contemporary discourse, there is a lot of mismatch between the means and the aims. If you look at sociological surveys and you see what kind of forms of life, what role of the state, not necessarily phrased in that way, would people want to have? What kind of you know, social securities and guarantees they would want to have? You as a scholar uh, of ideologies and state systems, which is what I uh, um, uh, call myself, understand that what people want is a socialist state. Yet, uh, because of historical reasons as to how the ideological uh, field has uh, been shaped and how uh, Russia and its aggression against Ukraine has instrumentalized and uh, hijacked the uh, Soviet history and legacy, it's very difficult in, with dressed in that language to sell, to explain to people that what they want is a social state. And that is a big task for people who are campaigning on the left in Ukraine. And indeed, ideology, ideas and material reality are intimately intertwined. And it's, it's also, it comes up in so many excellent examples through, uh, through the book. So I will, I will appeal to, uh, in, in my remaining time, to uh, both the, what I found uh, very important uh, as the contribution of the book in the conceptual way, but also what I find extremely useful for myself as a, as a teacher uh, of economic history and uh, as an activist and a, uh, and, and a feminist and a scholar of Ukraine. So in practice, what kind of empirical informing I find useful in this book. Um, so uh, the appeals to, uh, to the COVID pandemic and pandemic suppression policies and the social movements that came out of it is extremely important and, uh, and useful because that was also a form of a shared international experience, if you like, uh, that of course unevenly uh, with all sorts of different forms of intersectional oppression affected the whole uh, world population. But uh, in the case of Ukraine, uh, that also fell on uh, years of institutional transformation that ideologically was underpinned by market reforms. And that meant redefining the role of the state in the economy and de-development de that was expressed in real wage depreciation, high rates of inflation, currency depreciation, rapid rises in utility costs, underinvestment, and an even, in dis an even dismantling of infrastructure and public services, including healthcare, that led to economically driven migration, often, often of overqualified persons for low skill care and sex work. And of course, a lot of that weight of transition was carried on the shoulders, metaphorically speaking, and on the bodies of women. Uh, and there are, um, there are class and, uh, and race and ethnicity dimensions to that, not to the same extent as they are in the United States, for example, or in other places, but yet again, in every society, those are extremely unique. So what, what that story tells us and why, where these connections happen between, uh, between this story and what, uh, what the book is telling us is that ideologies of the market do not empower women. Market cap capitalist marketization erodes the social, structural, and, and uh, institutional scaffolding that props up production and social reproduction that it did in Soviet republics. There was, there was de-socialization of previously, previously socialized services, and, that, and uh, the story of what happened to gender relations and especially to women uh, because, of the, uh, because of how uh, society is structured in terms of gender roles, um, that is quite telling to us as to what is the final end story uh, when we allow markets to mediate all our social relationships. A lot of women were pushed into commercial surrogacy and were pushed to sign horrendous uh, contracts that pretty much reduced them to the status of breeding mares. Uh, and that kind of, inter that kind of extractivism uh, that, that is of course internationalized very often, like in the majority of cases, the commissioners come from abroad from rich families who for various reasons uh, cannot 
uh, obtain a child in a different way. Um, and that has been seen as a kind of a quick and easy way of making money. Some, some women are even, uh, you know, they, they have families and children already and, and, and husbands, and it's, it's a really painful thing to watch. Uh, and of course, the work has exacerbated the situation uh, even further, not specifically with surrogacy, but with the gendered aspect of uh, internal displacement, migration, and the care responsibilities that fall uh, on the shoulders of women. So in that sense, in, the, in informing the struggles of feminists who are fighting, uh, who have been fighting, are fighting, and still those feminist fights that are to happen in Ukraine and elsewhere international, I think this book is so extremely useful and so illuminating. I find the personal journey with which the book is uh, opens extremely touching, but also important because personal experiences shape us and are crucial in how we see ourselves and the direction of struggle we choose we choose to or are pushed to partake in. The opening discussion of the dissonance of declared values uh, of social surroundings, for example, uh, religious narratives uh, um, and the praxis and practice of racist classes and gender norms that are rooted in culture, religion, tradition, uh, and their so-called sacred cow status, despite their contradictory nature. That is something that uh, so many who will be reading the book, uh, if they haven't yet, will relate to, uh, as it is the pinnacle of unequal and oppressive systems that we live in, in different countries, in different societies. And those, um, those contradictions, of course, uh, shaped me just like as they shape any uh, any woman, any activist, and any any person really internationally. Uh, and it makes us think what what makes women, how women produced, uh, how our roles are produced and reproduced, depending on where we are historically and especially and temporally. Um, and uh, and the book offers us a lot in that regard, and it offers us a lot of these reflective uh, reflection points, uh, not least through the workbook, which is absolutely excellent, because the social, the material, the body, the mind, culture, and norm, identity, they're all uh, in, they're all permanently shaping and reshaping and, uh, and, and, and they're in the state of dialectic in the process of which both and all is and are undergoing transformation as was already highlighted by other speakers. So thank you for this analysis that is truly dialectical because intersectional feminism uh, sometimes uh, offers us certain uh, points of connecting various aspects of oppression, but I haven't uh, come across uh, too much of it that does it so well as you do in this book with bringing and centering dialectic indeed, but not reducing it to class. That is so, uh, that is so wonderful. So I, and I also really enjoyed the discussion around some key concepts such as commodity fetishism, reification, overdetermination that are done in a truly socialist feminist way. Uh, that was an absolute joy to read. The discussion of feminist theories of womanhood and femininity, for example, and feminism, I found very useful and fruitful the need and discussion the need of the discussion of intersectional uh, in its deepest meaning is all the way throughout the book again without uh, with, with proper inclusion of class without being reductionist uh, but rather providing a cross-sectional social materialist analysis that is performing in meaningful intra inter and transnational form where special temporal contingent uh, assessments and examples are given for how concrete gendered social and right erased uh, and classed social institutions deemed oppressive by some feminists were in fact not only uh, and not everywhere such. Uh, once our analytical focus looks beyond wine middle uh, and upper class uh, relations of property and division of labor in the household and passing that property uh, through generations. And uh, one, one example that kind of really comes to my mind is the institution of marriage uh, that in itself actually can be as uh, social, provide a social lift as well as uh, can be uh, oppressive. And those kind of contradictions and historical variations and cultural forms of it are so important to look at because indeed uh, these kind of um, uh, understanding how those contradictions are shaped and how you can have oppression and emancipation embedded in the same institution, depending on which political subject you're looking at and embedded in the same political subject. That is what we need to understand if we want to build a society that actually dismantles the forms of oppression rather than reifies them and actually reproduces them in other forms, because we, we do need to look at the whole at the whole picture at the same time and at the, all 
of those contradictions if we are to uh, to get we, we cannot just get rid of oppressions one by one. We need to look at how they work as a system uh, and how indeed they get reproduced, uh, not least uh, on ideological level through the institution of the family and the household, as some uh, speakers already made the appeal to. So. So that kind of the system that we need to build, and this is one of the things that I really like about this, because it tries to actually offer us a roadmap, and that is so amazing. Um, because that question, what is to be done, is something that very often is sort of like, uh, is not there in a lot of books. Uh, there is analysis, but there isn't quite what do we need to do now, and that is there, the kind of the, the attempt to offer an, an, an understanding of how to build the system where no person should have to, for example, exchange emotion uh, for uh, exchange money for emotion or imitation of sex in the family, right? And uh, dozens of other uh, forms of, uh, of oppressions and marketizations and commercializations and oppressions. The book offers us empirical root and an empirical root and dissection of categories that get operationalized. Uh, in many feminist uh, scholarly contribution, uh, and I, I really enjoyed reading through uh, through through those analysis. And indeed, uh, this this book uh, is the one that takes a socialist society as its final aim. And from that, a lot of things kind of start falling into place, because this this is the this is the kind of society that that is attempted to be built. Uh, the one where sex, gender, race, class, sexuality, and identity no longer have an impact on the social pecking order. Uh, and when you get that as a starting point, it allows you to deliver a theorization that fleshes out precisely how these categories become operationalized to manufacture social division that then gets instrumentalized for the sake of oppression and extraction and capital accumulation. So once you understand all of those processes, then you know what you need to do to get rid of them. And of course, discussions uh, on carceral capital, uh, capitalism and authoritarianism also add so much richness to this analysis because without them, we cannot quite understand understand how the system of oppression works. Um, and uh, lastly, but not uh, last but not least, I found very interesting and important the fact that the book offers this kind of alternative understanding on how to build feminism for the future, for emancipation once and for all, beyond uh, ribbons on social media, beyond slogans, be, uh, but actually rooted in practical solidarity networks, and programs uh, in ideas on how to fight oppression and discrimination of all different sorts uh, everywhere and at the same time. Uh, not least because there is, even if I found there isn't necessarily a separate conversation uh, about uh, the ideological frames through which some of that is being done, but uh, some of it is in, embedded in a lot of other discussions. Because if you look at kind of how, if you dismantle institutions that reproduce certain ideologies, the ideologies to, will go away. But I, I do agree that it would be good to have a, a separate conversation. But again, I guess if uh, if the book is having the scope that it does, it's kind of it's difficult to have absolutely every everything in there. But I think. The fact that we have so many different questions at the end of reading this book in itself uh, or, or other comments and kind of we want so much more out of it is, is also a testimony to the breadth of the scope and the richness of conversation that the book uh, opens indeed. So one of the things that I want to, uh, so the thing that I want to finish and then the question I want to ask um, is that we need to be, there are conversations about the state being this institution of oppression and, and uh, it's being uh, crucial in capitalist accumulation and extraction. And it is so by design, by design. But how do we then design the state? Because there are certain functions of state as an institution, as an abstract institution. How can we design away oppression? Because it's not just the state, it's a lot of supranational institutions and also in international security infrastructure. We see now the failure and uh, incapacity to, for example, United Nations security infrastructure uh, to, to deal with a lot of different uh, conflicts around the world, not just now, but uh, systematically. It is, it is by design hierarchical and not necessarily conducive to, um, to help those who are, who are in need and who are weaker. So uh, how do we then, so two things, how do we dismantle the ideologies that reproduces the many oppressions while resources are limited for those who are actually fighting against it? And the further we go, the more inequalities around the world, the, the, the more the stakes are against us, even though the movements are becoming bigger. 
Uh, and the second thing is like, what, what, how would that state look like? What, how do we uh, have the social function of the state? What kind of institution do we need for that to, for that to be operational? So that there are, so that there is socialized, uh, socialized uh, social reproduction work. There are certain institutions working, but at the same time, that is not done in an oppressive way. I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you so much for this excellent book, and uh, I'm going to be using it in teaching. And I really look forward to the rest of the discussion. It's it's an honor to be a part of it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Yulia, for your timely discussion on key ideas and concepts that Frida has uh, mentioned in her book, as well as your praise for Frida's dialectical analysis and her offering up a, a roadmap uh, for what is to be done, you know, in the future. Thank you very much, Yulia. All right, so thank you again to all of our panelists uh, for giving their thoughtful comments on the book, as well as, you know, uh, talking about def different um, things that are happening now in the world and, and offering up questions as well. So uh, now we'll give Frida time to answer some of the questions that the panelists have asked. Uh, so whenever you're ready, Frida. Thank you so much. This has been a great conversation and um, I was just busy taking notes and I can't possibly respond to everything, but I'm going to try to single out a few and i'm going to go in the same order so start with um, resident hennessy and end with yulia yurchenko um so um rosemary um asked about the question of the relationship between humanity and nature and the role of socialist feminism in um uh, really further defining um environmentalism and combating uh, the direction of capitalism, which is completely destroying the earth. Um, I think that you, uh, you're right, that we really need to focus on the question of what value means to clarify the distinction between value in a capitalistic sense, which is the product of alienated labor and which leads to a society in which relationships between humans and between humans and nature are strictly utilitarian based on selfishness, narrow self-interest, um, and therefore women's work, women's reproductive work, or, or any type of uh, reproductive work that involves gender is not valued in a human sense. Um, so we definitely need to do that. And we definitely need to further explore and discuss Marx's concept of the metabolic interaction between humanity and nature, which he discusses in near the end of Capital. Um, but it's, you know, the idea is throughout Capital, the idea that capitalism destroys this interaction that allows for what we take from the earth to then be sent back to the earth. And for this process of uh, of um, reproduction to continue in a way that um, that enriches humanity and nature instead of impoverishing us and destroying nature. So uh, we need to discuss that concept of metabolic interaction. And in general, I think that I felt for a long time that socialist feminists need to have a much more active role in actually talking about alternatives to the current uh, climate disaster that we have right now. In other words, there's so many possibilities that it's solar energy, there's so many possibilities in relationship to also parts of North Africa and the Sahara Desert that can allow for creating energy for the whole world. But from a capitalistic sense, it's not money-making. So we don't hear that being discussed, but yeah, we need to be in the forefront of discussing these possibilities in a very, practical, uh, a specific manner. And um, on the question of ideology, I think that's a fantastic question because there's no doubt that when you look at the United States, you look at the whole world that, where you see these um, closeness between those who support authoritarian populists in a population and those who don't. And it's everywhere you look, the vote seems so close, not everywhere, but in many, many places. And um, 
there's no doubt that ideology is having an impact, the racist ideology, the misogynist ideology. So we cannot underestimate the role of, of, of ideology. But I think that if we look at it from the Althusserian point of view, it's problematic because Althusser is so opposed to humanism. And he's so, so deeply opposed to any type of Hegelian Marxism that he closes the door to a humanist way of, of, of combating ideology by seeing both the oppositional um, uh, desires and ideas within the subjects themselves and also seeing how ideas have a role, philosophical intervention has a role in um, further developing that internal, uh, uh, or what, Mar what Marx calls quest for universality. That's what I, in my book, in the chapter, chapter two on authoritarianism, I tried to show both, both authoritarianism from the vantage point of you know, why Marx says that capitalism leads to authoritarianism. What is that conceptually? To what are the distinct features of idea, authoritarianism, capitalist authoritarianism today? And three, what the struggles are against authoritarianism from you know, the, um, North Africa, Middle East, Latin America, Ukraine, um, Hong Kong, China. Um, I've, I haven't mentioned them all. I'm sorry if I've skipped a few, but you, you read them all in the chapter. And uh, so we need to do all of that in order to combat ideology. But I think your question is very, very well put and, and thank you. Now um, to um, Oksana, again, I'm only going to zoom in on a question because there's so much in each person's talk that I could discuss. But uh, also Oksana asked about um, organization and, and um, the type of organization that is not dogmatic but rooted in history and can allow for um, dealing with contradictions and differences in a way that's not destructive. Um, I fabulous question and it's um, something that we really need to discuss a lot further. But I think the, the main point that I would like to argue here is that the problem that we seem to have with organization is either we go for the very um, vanguardist type of like uh, top-down approach, centralist, or we go to focus on decentralization, which is important. But then decentralization becomes an end in itself or we even say we're against authoritarianism, we're against hierarchy, all of that is important. We need to be against authoritarianism. We need to not have hierarchy. But, but then the question of the philosophy of the organization gets thrown by the wayside or it doesn't even get discussed. Like, What are the principles of the organization? What is our understanding of political economy? What is our understanding of all these concepts like self other, Marxist concept of alienation and humanism? that we need to build the type of organization where people can relate to each other in a way that is uh, humanist and um, that involves understanding each other and growing as a result of, of um, dealing with differences. Uh, these are conceptual issues that need to be understood. Um, and uh, we also don't, um, uh, we don't have an internationalist sense. I mean, I've been involved in, efforts to create international coalitions where people come together around certain principles and we all seem to agree. And then when it comes to, down to doing the work, people don't really want to take responsibility, even at the very basic level of writing articles or reports or doing correspondence. Um, it's, it's amazing that we seem, to, we seem to agree with it on this level of of slogans or signing a petition, but when it actually comes to doing it, uh, it's very hard to have that kind of discipline of people who really um, do the work. And I'm not talking about um, doing, um, you know, math. And um, uh, you, Wanda, you, you I really appreciate what you brought out a, a, about the Kumbahi River Collective and. Audrey Lord and uh, also Octavio Butler, uh, which really highlights the fact that in this book, I was trying to say that what black feminists argue, especially 
uh, Audre Lorde and the Combahee River Collective, when they argue that we are here to challenge both the, uh, the structural oppression, but also the oppression within our struggle, the sexism, the um, class attitudes within the movement itself, the, of course, the racism within the feminist movement. Um, and um, when, when Black feminists really argue for, or Joy James and, and other Black feminists who discusses that, when they argue for addressing both issues at the same time, I thought that there's, um, that's a real philosophical contribution because, and it goes directly to a, 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 um, a dialogue with the humanist type of Marxism that I advocate. The idea that we are, that liberation means not only um, addressing the outside oppressors, but addressing the contradictions within the movements that uh, promote relations of domination. And in the chapter, chapter eight of the book, uh, where I discuss the relationship of self to other, I also have a section where I discuss the dialogue or what I see as a dialogue between Audre Lorde and Hegel. And um, the, in both cases, there is a critique of uh, pluralism uh, in the sense that not that they're against uh, diversity, but in the sense that um, if we just talk about differences um, being tolerated without being heard and being understood, then um, that's just a form of indifference. And, and Audre Lorde critiques that, Franz Fanon critiques that in Black Skin, White Mass. So I saw, uh, I saw a, a connection there between Ego, between Audre Lorde and Fanon. And, um, so that was the philosophical contribution that I thought that Audre Lorde was making. And, uh, and um, thank you, Wanda, for bringing that out. And then um, and Yulia's uh, comments. Um, okay, so one, one question I wanted to say about um, the, that I really, yes, uh, Yuli, I appreciate your discussion of what market capitalism does to women. And I also appreciate your book on Ukraine. It's a really important book and I hope everyone here gets a copy or at least reads parts of the book. Yulia has made a tremendous contribution to discussing, so expressing solidarity with Ukraine from, a, from an anti-capitalist point of view, but not falling for both, actually both Yulia and Oksana. They've, um, they can show us that we as socialist feminists can express our solidarity with the Ukrainian struggle for self-determination and Ukrainian feminists were, let's not forget, fighting mass rapes, systematic rapes from Russia's in, in invasion. But at the same time, um, have a clear anti-capitalist uh, standpoint and not uh, be um, lumped in with, uh, you know, a, simply a, um, a liberal uh, opposition to uh, Putin's invasion. Um, and uh, okay, so so I appreciate your critique of market capitalism. And, and I agree that the pandemic really did strengthen a state capitalist intervention. But at the same time, I was trying, what I was trying to show in chapter two on authoritarianism was that state capitalism or the state capitalist direction that we're seeing now actually even preceded the pandemic and was rooted in the logic of capitalism that moves in the direction of concentration and centralization of capital. And um, at the same time, Yulia asked the question about, okay, so what about the non, uh, what, what type of state are we going to have in a socialist society? And uh, what would that look like? And well, that's what I try to uh, discuss in chapter seven on alternatives to capitalism and socialist feminist and humanist alternative to capitalism, where I argue on the basis of a return to Marx that, uh, and of course, a, an understanding of what state capitalism was uh, in uh, USSR and Maoist China and Raya Dunesca's very meticulous critiques of state capitalism in both countries. I try to argue that in the end, our alternative cannot be a state form. It has to be a non-state form, but it has to be a, a, a democratic form of collectivities 
that are both local, national, and international. And there has to be that con constant relationship at the local, national, and international level. And that in order for us to have any kind of complete break with capitalism, that we need to start with ending the domination of abstract time over the process of production, which means that it's when we when when we talk about workers' control of production, it's not just the question of workers come together and produce still on a capitalistic basis, but that the very idea that how much time we need to produce, not, not only what we produce, but how much time we need to produce, whether it's goods or services, it cannot be decided behind the backs of the producers. It has to be decided by the producers based on their local situation, national, international situation. And it can be different in different places, depending on the um, people involved, on the local conditions, the environmental conditions, the state of technology. Uh, and whereas under capitalism, uh, there is a, there's basically a global socially necessary labor time that's decided behind the backs of the producers and make allows for some people's work of time to be more valuable than others. In this, based on this Marxian understanding, um, time, an hour of work, whether it's done in Iran or in South Africa or in um, Latin America or US, it, it has to entitle people to the uh, uh, means of consumption, the goods and services, that um, that anyone else anywhere else would be entitled to with that hour that you can't discriminate and, and, uh, and therefore in order to not do have that type of discrimination you need to not have the domination of abstract time or socially what Marx calls socially necessary labor time over the process of production uh, for those who um, might not relate to these concepts if you read chapter seven of the book I really try to go through this in very um, step-by-step -step, uh, explanation. And I, I think that it's gonna be much more comprehensible in, uh, after reading that chapter. So I will stop for now and thank you all for your, um, for your wonderful, valuable comments. Okay, thank you, Frida, so much for your responses to the question that the panelists offered. Um, and now we're going to move on to uh, the next se section, which is um, questions from the audience. Um, we have one question from Olivia Glover, and um, their question is, does what needs to change vary interculturally due to cultural differences, or is it relatively universal for all feminists? And I don't know if uh, they were directing it to anyone, uh, to a particular person or to whoever maybe wants to take the question. I'll start, uh, but I think Frida can add a little more to that particular question. I think what she points out in the book, which is very, very important, and those who have studied early Marxism is that, Oftentimes, Marxism was ignored because it was considered deterministic or it didn't work because you you have uh, even in a book like Dawn of Everything with David Grober, um, you have people who forget the interconnectivity and the assessment and that although Marx spent more time in terms of where he lived in terms of Britain, the historical materialism as a scientific tool can be applied in the Sudan and Ethiopia. And Frida is very careful about addressing that issue in the different forms of state capitalism as it is being uh, in China today, uh, as it is in Russia today. Um, she talks about how the state uh, is dealing with uh, Chinese one-child rule and 
how they're addressing that and the forms of oppression and domination that takes uh, in Myanmar, uh, uh, the uh, oppression and rape of women. Uh, she is very specific in allowing the intercultural and the different forms of Marxist humanism as it would applied, as she just alluded to, is understanding how these foundational and principles can be used by women all over. The dialogue critical is understanding that I, as a woman in the United States dealing with black consciousness, with feminist consciousness, but I understand and reach out to women in the Ukraine, to women and immigrants in uh, China, that I'm dealing with the intercultural aspects by the compassion and the dialectical understanding what is the uh, groundwork for the differences. Uh, yes, and I um, thank you, Wanda, and and I, I I agree with what Wanda just said. And the only thing I would like to add to it is that uh, um, I try to address this question uh, both specifically by talking about different uh, feminist struggles, different women's struggles around the globe, and also conceptually by discussing it in chapter eight on the relationship of self to other where I discuss the, you know, how we, we bring together the individual struggle, the particular struggle and the universal. And that liberation involves this constant inner dialogue or dialogue between the individual, the particular, the universal that we cannot stay at any particular level and that we need to, um, we need to see life as this continuing effort to, to articulate how our individual struggle relates to the, our particular situation uh, or the particular, or, or could be particular, could also be a struggle against racism or against ethnic um, discrimination or for instance, feminism and universal concepts of liberation. And those have to be continuously rethought and re-articulated and further enriched and further developed. And that's the only way we can have emancipation. And that's the only way we can fight dogmatism. Okay, thank you very much, Wanda and Frida, for your responses to the audience question. Um, one last question from the audience. This is from Fermin Valle. Um, any thoughts on how socialist feminism can be used to analyze an ideological and hegemonic gender and sex binary or belief system that serves to reproduce systems and relations of social reproduction? Now, um, this question wasn't uh, directed to anyone in particular, so if anyone wants to respond. Um, I could quickly respond to that. It's a, it's a massive question, and I think we need to, you know, there are volumes and volumes written about it, so it's very difficult to go into. One thing that I would say is that before we, before we start thinking of answers to these uh, important questions, first of all, it's very, it's important to understand that when we talk about binaries, uh, or non-binaries in terms of sex. And when we talk about those in terms of gender, they're not the same thing. And the spectrums that we're dealing with in terms of uh, body uh, or behaviors of the body and performances are quite something else. Uh, and while there is nothing in our biology that spells oppression of one by another, it's how we engage socially that spells that. So I think that once we deal away with uh, oppressive gender norms uh, and, uh, and performances uh, and assigning certain, uh, certain power to some in certain ways, uh, then we can be talking about, um, uh, then we can be talking about emancipating bodies, including in the way uh, that uh, Frida 
uh, does so well uh, in her book. And I think this whole point, it also kind of links with the previous question about uh, when we look at uh, how much extraction happens in terms of time and effort, to what degree is everybody is alienated? So like, if you will look at what, what happens to a specific person, depending on where they are positioned in the system of oppression uh, and how much is extracted of them and how much oppression is applied to them. And if we try to live that, then we, then we can be talking about some universal formula, if you like, that of course will take a different expression depending on which country, which culture, which religion we're talking about, because of course people are oppressed in different ways. Uh, but again, in, uh, in, in, our, in our bodies, be it our sex, be it our, uh, uh, be it our race, be it our hair color or our height, there is nothing innate that can spell oppression. It's only mediated through social relations. And that is our kind of main terrain um, to, to support our bodies in every possible way and to make sure that uh, no, matter, no matter what they are, uh, and how they are, that they are accepted, that they are supported, that there is medical service provided for them, that they are included uh, and supported in the workplace, uh, that there are no stigmas around us. And I think in that sense, we can start thinking of, um, uh, of, uh, of, of emancipation matrices, if you like. Let me also suggest that uh, Girl, Woman, Other by Bernardine Aravisto that won the Booker Award in Britain talks about binary and non-binary relationships and how they're expressed as the daughter of a Nigerian immigrant into Britain. Um, she uh, does it in a literary sense but she covers the oppression and the domination. Uh, and that's an excellent start uh, to add with Frida's uh, chapter seven uh, to understand those uh, reproductive uh, anal an analysis. Okay. Yeah, I'll just add that I think Frida's chapters on queer theory and on social reproduction are really excellent teaching guides for you know, how we can make connections between issues that have been kept so far apart. And, and I'll just say that I, I think the other piece that works throughout her book is the way that she helps us understand that gender, and I'll include sexuality here, and race are cultural discourses that get weaponized ideologically and then appropriated into what are basically the relations of class, the relations of exploitation. And she also helps us understand how those discourses operate within and, and for forms of domination. One of the things that I think is so tricky in, in movement work is that the vocabularies that we use often are kind of messy and don't really help us think clearly and understand what I, what I see, which, you know, I mean, this is the work we're doing now, it's helping each other, but that there are structures within capitalism of human relations. And then there are positions within them that articulate as the, the specifics of how people are historically and differently situated within those structures. And some of those structures are ideological and cultural and others are economic. So class, race and gender are really not the same. And Frida's book is helping anyone who reads it, you know, including myself, it's always a process of rereading and relearning and and helping oneself understand better because it's so mystifying. The, you know, the relations that we live in are often so mystifying and so inviting us to forget. So I think this is a great question um, and, and it takes us to think about the previous question as well. You know, that is, how do we understand these cultural and particular differences and some of the structures or a broader ranging relations of capital that 
in the situation of global capitalism, we are all, all differently positioned within. Great, thank you very much. Thank you very much everyone for your wonderful responses to Fermin's question. Okay, and then um, uh, I have one last question to kind of conclude this and it's a bit of a simple question, but I would like to direct it to Frida. Um, so Frida, if you had to choose one message, if we had to pin you down so that you had to choose one message that you'd like the reader of your book to walk away with, uh, what would it be? Or two or three or four. No, 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 that's fine. That's great, that's a great question. Um, I think that I have tried to show that um, oppression cannot be reduced to exploitation. But at the same time, the way I have tried to show it is to go back to Marx's understanding of the capitalist mode of production and how it's not just about unequal distribution, it's about uh, alienated relationships, alienation from not only what we produce, but how we produce from other human beings and from our potential, our potential, I'm not saying we reach that potential, but our potential for free and conscious activity. And so that's what, the capitalist mode of production meant to Marx. That, and that's why he, he was arguing that it leads to alienation and it leads to relations of domination, not only at work, but in every sphere of life, family, in, in educational institutions. And so, and of course, in terms of race and gender, um, uh, relations of domination, not only as to go from one race to another, but within within each race too. Um, so um, I guess that would be the main point that I've tried to show why oppression cannot be reduced to exploitation, but from that standpoint. And so I, I, I think that my argument does not allow for economic determinism. And it allows also for us to really embrace the Me Too movement against gender violence by showing that, uh, but, but by also helping it uh, reach its potential, which is that it has the potential to challenge uh, capitalism for its commodification of human relations, this dehumanization of human, human beings. And, uh, um, and it also, uh, gives us the possibility to think about an alternative to capitalism and racism, that sexism, that isn't economic determinist, but also not simply separating ideology from the uh, economic aspect. The two are, you know, are, are inseparable from what, on the basis of what I've tried to argue. And, uh, and at the same time, I think this book through its analysis of capitalism as what causes alienation, as what creates relations of alienated human relations, gives us, helps us to get to the understanding of what the alternative can be, both economically and philosophically in terms of re-articulating the relationship of self to other in a way that's not based on domination. So this is like the, the motif of the book that gets elaborated, you know, from one level to another to another, in a way, I would argue that if you just want to read one chapter of the book and you don't have time, that's still okay because I think I've tried to give, argue the message of the book in each chapter without being repetitive. Um, so enjoy and please send me your questions. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Frida, for responding to my question. All right, uh, unless there are any more comments, um, I think that is the conclusion of our program, okay? Uh, I would like to thank the panelists for all of their wonderful comments and insightful reflections on socialist feminism. Um, thanks also to Historical Materialism and Paul Reynolds for sponsoring this event. Um, if you would like to order a copy of Socialist Feminism, A New Approach, you can go to the Pluto Press website or Amazon or your independent bookseller.
Okay. Uh, you are also welcome to visit Frida Afari's website, which she showed you earlier. Uh, it is socialistfeminism.org. Okay. Uh, you'll be able to keep up with articles by Frida as well as other events and campaigns that she is following. And um, if you would like to learn more about historical materialism, the journal, the book series, and conferences, you can go to www.historicalmaterialism.org. Okay. Um, and I'd like to end with a quote by feminist scholar Audre Lorde um, in her keynote address, The Use of Anger. I am 